Okay, well, I guess let's officially get started. Thank you all for joining us today for the stay at home safari to Namibia. I definitely see a lot of familiar faces here, but it also looks like we have a good number of people who are joining us for the first time. So I'd like to give you a little bit of background on Zagram Expeditions. We are actually celebrating our 30th anniversary this year. Uh, since our founders started the company, we have been committed to crafting innovative, sustainable, and responsible adventures to all seven continents by land and by sea. Our award-winning expeditions travel well off the beaten path and are designed specifically for curious ex explorers. Our expert leaders and experienced local guides offer educational components to all of our adventures. And on all of our expeditions, you stay at world-class properties, dine on delicious cuisine, and enjoy an in-depth exploration of your destination. We've been offering African safaris since our inception, and we pride ourselves in working with some of the continent's very best guides, which of course includes your host today, Chris Stamper. Uh, Chris grew up in South Africa, where his love of the natural world materialized at a very young age, thanks to lots of family explorations of the country's national parks and preserves. Lucky guy. Uh, he then began his career with wildlife, working in the African bush, and he progressed from an animal tracker to a guide and is now a professional trainer and a very popular private safari guide. So over those last two decades, Chris developed a comprehensive knowledge of and uncanny ability to spot Africa's flora and fauna. Not only is Chris a wealth of information, he is also really fun to travel with, and his love of all things Africa is truly infectious. So he is a wonderful person to experience the wonders of Namibia with. But I can't forget, Chris is also joined today by a very special guest, Dr. Lori Marker a leading expert on the cheetah, and the founder and executive director of the Cheetah Conservation Fund. The CCF is also celebrating their 30th anniversary this year, making it the longest running conservation organization dedicated to cheetah survival. Uh, Dr. Marker has led a very long and illustrious career in the world of wildlife conservation, receiving her doctorate in zoology from the University of Oxford's Wild Crew and publishing over 120 scientific peer-reviewed papers. She's a member of several organizations that work toward the conservation of large cats, has won numerous awards for her research contributions, was named a hero for the planet by Time Magazine, and has been featured on a number of television documentaries, news, and talk shows. She has been studying cheetahs for over 40 years and we'll be sharing information on her research and the important work the CCF is doing a bit later in the presentation. And side note, we will be visiting the CCF on the Namibia under Canvas trip. So that is plenty for me. I know you're all looking forward to this virtual journey. So I will just go ahead and hand things over to Chris. He'll start sharing his screen and we'll be whisked away to this beautiful country, a place I've always wanted to visit. Fantastic, Sonia. Thank you very much for those kind words. Um, and thank you to everybody else who's um, taken time out of the day to join us today. Um, it's uh, an honor to be sharing the stage um, with Dr. Laurie Marker today, who um, just a few days ago I got to meet um, in person via Zoom um, and was just blown away because, you know, so often I've switched on and watched um, uh, your doc documentary about cheetahs and wildlife conservation and seen Laurie's face uh, be behind it all. And so, so thank you, Laurie. I can't wait. I'll make mine as quick as possible so that I'll leave the stage for you later. <laughs> right, now let's see if I can share the screen. Um, how are we looking there? Good. All good, Sonia? Fantastic. Fantastic. I just want to put on my, my jumper at the moment or my, my fleece. Believe it or not, folks, it gets cold in Africa. We're sitting here today just a few degrees Celsius above uh, freezing. Um, there's been a massive cold front. There's even snow in parts of South Africa at the moment, and it's getting really cold in the evenings. We, it's about 20 minutes or 23 minutes to 10 o'clock here in South Africa. Um, I live in the eastern part of South Africa in a small little town called Hootspreit, 
which is a stone's throw away from quite a well-known national park known as the Kruger National Park. And um, so I've been very lucky to live in a small little town whilst uh, most of the world has been um, uh, caught in a quite a draconian, especially South Africa, quite a draconian lockdown. I've had uh, the possibility to get out and explore um, parts of, parts of the, the nature world more recently, um, other parts of uh, um, our province. And so it's been great. Lots of wildlife in our garden. Um, somebody just needs to, there we go, mute the, themselves. Great. So we're talking about Namibia. Um, so Namibia, the, the Namibian under uh, canvas trip that we are doing next year, it's been run from the 19th of April 2021 till the 1st of May 2021. Great time to go to Namibia. Um, the reason for, for that is, is that most of the rain has fallen already and uh, things are starting to dry out in the desert. And um, that means that it doesn't get very cold. The days can be nice and warm, but the evenings are also very comfortable. So it's a great time of year to come on safari, um, especially to Namibia. Um, we might even get a bit of green still around in the desert, which is also great too. Right, so I'm going to talk to you just a little bit um, <coughs> about uh, Namibia as a country. Um, it's a fantastic place. It's, it's quite large. It's about three and a half times the size of Great Britain. It's got a population of just over two million. The capital city is not Windhoek, but Windhoek, which means windy corner. And the currency is the Namibian dollar which for those of you who've traveled to South Africa before, it's the same as, it's on the same level as the South African Rand. So at the moment, the dollar is nice and strong against the, the Namibian dollar. So there's really good uh, uh, value for money there. They drive on the left-hand side, the correct side of the road. <laughs> um, and their national beer is Vintuk Lager, which you'll be introduced. So if you like beer, this is, what uh, the, the national beer of, of uh, Namibia looks like. Right, so the trip, if you can all see my cursor, starts in Vintuk. And typically you would take your international flight and you would land in Vintuk, uh, where you would be met once you've come through um, customs and immigration, you've collected your bag and when you come through into the very small and intimate international airport arrival at Vintuk, there'll be somebody standing with the Zegram sign, as always, and they'll whisk you away um, <coughs> um, to the, the Hotel Am Weinberg, um, uh, where, where we will be staying for that first night. If you decide to, like some people do, to come a little bit earlier, uh, what can be done there is um, if you want to explore Vintuk, the town, or if you've got any specific interests like birding, um, Zegram uh, in the office can uh, easily sort out a day trip or have you, you know, I, I know from previous experience that some people like to arrive a day or two in order to acclimate before heading out on the trip. And so Vintuk's a lovely place. You don't have to travel too far outside of the, the capital to get into some really beautiful spots. Um, just a little shot of the Am Weinberg, which used to, is on your way into town, into the city. It's quite a small city, just over about 400,000 people that live in the city of uh, Vintuk. And um, it's a lovely little place with some good restaurants to, to eat. It's a great place to start our trip. And we'll spend the night there of the, on the 20th of April. And then the following day, head out on safari. Um, in, the, in, in and around the, the town of Vintuk are some really cool birds for those who like birding, like the, uh, the rosy-faced uh, uh, lovebird over here, or the Montero's hornbill, amongst many others. Another good thing if you've got a few hours to spare when you're in, uh, in, in Vintuk, is to go down to the iconic Joe's Beer House. Now, Joe's Beer House 
will serve all the types of uh, Nam Namibian, German um, cuisine that you'd expect, like big ice vines. Uh, they've got a delicious two and a half kilogram ice vine, which you can uh, which you can get stuck into. Uh, there's also the, a number of other really good dishes like sauerkraut, etc., that you can feast on there. Right. But that, it's always a great place. Joe's Beer House is always wonderful. It's filled with character and charm, and there's always people returning from safari, etc. So it's a really cool place. Um, the following day, we are going to be flying. Um, this trip, what makes this trip so nice is that uh, from Vintuk, you we're going to fly for half of the, the time, and then the, the rest of the time will be overland, um, which is great because the, the doing it both flying and driving helps you to get two very different perspectives of the, the landscape. So we'll head out um, on the morning that we depart. We'll head, uh, head through to uh, another airport, not the international airport, and we'll fly down to Sossus Flay. And this picture really gives you um, an idea of these beautiful mountains. Um, there's superb topography as we fly from Vintuk heading southwest, um, it starts getting drier and drier and drier until the amazing views uh, that one sort of, when my wife saw the pictures for the first time, she said, oh, I remember the English patient. So those of you who've ever watched the English patient, it's very similar to that flying over. On the ground, as soon as we land, um, Typically, the, the aircraft that we fly in are small to medium-sized aircraft, and we'll be often landing on uh, makeshift uh, runways, in other words, gravel runways, not tarmac runways, but they are very safe. And on the ground, as soon as we arrive, we'll get to meet our local guides. Um, luckily, traveling with Zebram, we always know that um, on the ground, we get access to some of the best guides in, uh, in the countries that we do go and visit who uh, uh, will show us amazing local knowledge of, of the flora and fauna, history, uh, the um, culture, etc., which is always great. So, yeah, this is on our last Zegram trip to Namibia. That's Stuart Moshepo. Uh, fantastic local guide. That's him and I in the middle of Damara land, which we'll get to later. Right, so on arrival at the airstrip, we'll be whisked away in our game drive vehicles towards uh, our first camp, Camp Sossus. The amazing thing about this camp is, first of all, the very unique design. You can see how they've upcycled a whole lot of uh, oil drum tins as wind breaks. So the desert can get quite windy at night time. And so to break that wind against our canvas tent, uh, they've, they've made these makeshift um, uh, upcycled wind breaks and uh, it, it looks very cool. The, the nice thing about Camp Sossus, it's quite close to Sossus Flay, only about a half an hour drive. And the wonderful thing about it is that we will be the only people there. Uh, Zagram have taken exclusive use for the 10 participants for this uh, magic itinerary. So our first night will be the only people in camp and it will be very, very cool. That's what the interior of the tents look like. Just because you're camping doesn't mean you have to rough it. You can see all the tents have the types of amenities that one would expect from electricity to running water. Um, you can have a nice warm shower, which is magnificent. Um, and there at the, the bottom of the screen here, you can see uh, the beautiful Namibian night sky um, and our canvas tent. One of the things which hit me the most the first time I went to Namibia was just these massive, massive skies. I know it sounds strange that the sky is bigger, but I definitely think that the sky is much bigger in Namibia than anywhere else in the world. Um, the stars poke out at you, and uh, one of the great things to do, if you can, is to sleep under the stars. And this is uh, actually available here at Camp Sossus, just flicking through um, ahead to 
Above each of the rooms is these beautiful beds that are made up that you can sleep and wake up underneath the stars. It's quite, quite spectacular, really great. And don't worry if you decide that you don't want to sleep um, upstairs, you can sleep back inside your tent. The nice part about Sauce's Flay is that there's not too many dangerous animals um, around. So there is a sense of freedom. If you want to do a short guided walk, one can do that. If um, you want to just relax and have a sundowner, we can do that too. Um, and then as this, the stars start to come out, one of the things that you will hear throughout most of uh, Namibia are the noisy barking geckos. A small gecko, only about that large, and uh, he comes out just as the sun is setting and starts barking and very noisy. They live during the day, they live in little holes it, that they dig out underneath the ground. So Sausage Flay, the reason that we, the first um, stop is in Sausage Flay is for these magnificent red sand dunes. Um, and what we typically will do on a day that we head down to the Sossos Flay is we'll leave nice and early so that we can get the, the, the best views of, first of all, the dunes. It's always photographs much nicer early in the morning where you get the shadows in the dunes like you can see here. Another iconic dune. Um, and pretty much just so you get a sense of it, Sossos Flay, when you enter the, the National Park gate, and you, you head down this, an ephemeral river. There's a nice big word for you for uh, Namibia. And you'll, if you've never heard of the word ephemeral before, you'll hear it a thousand times by the time you finished a Namibian trip. Because most of the rivers, except for the river in the very north and the very south, are all dry ephemeral rivers. So rivers that just flow when there's a lot of rain. Otherwise, the water flows well beneath the surface. Um, but there, just to give you scale of these beautiful, magnificent dunes, at the bottom here are camel thorn trees, which are probably 30 to 40 feet high, just to give you an idea of the scale of these massive dunes. As you drive down the ephemeral river, you pass dune after dune after dune after dune, until you come to the very end, to a parking lot, you get out the vehicles and you start walking. This is us walking up to a place called Dead Flay or Dead Pan. And the iconic photographs of Dead Pan, I'll have to come back to those. These are some of the creatures that one might see in the Nam of Desert, such as the horned adder or a barking gecko during the day or the brown hyena tracks that were left on the road on the walk up or ostrich tracks that are, have been left through the sand, or the white lady spider, or these amazing darkling beetles. Now, the darkling beetle, this tenebroinid uh, beetle, is one that will sit on the top of the dunes, and at night time, because in some years it doesn't, it can hardly rain in Sosus Flay, at night, uh, night time, early in the morning, he'll stand and get the mist on his body, the mist then falls on his body and trickles down towards his mouth, and that's how he collects his water. But this is Dead Flay. Dead Flay, I'm sure most of you have uh, looked up about Namibia, will see that it is an incredibly beautiful place. They, these dead, petrified um, camel thorn trees with the red sand of the dunes surrounding them and the white caked um, silty mud on the floor with the blue sky as a backdrop. Just stunning, stunning, as you can see there. Really, really beautiful. But um, if you do head out on, on the way back, you, you're certainly going to find yourself, uh, your, your shoes filled with this, the, the sand, the red sand. The red sand is quite interesting where it comes from um, on the southern boundary of Namibia. Namibia is a um, southern neighbor to us, South Africa, in the north, Angola, and then to the east, to Botswana. And the southern boundary of Namibia is a big river known as the Orange River, which flows through into the Atlantic Ocean. And the, the up-dwelling uh, 
and current, uh, the, the cold Benguela current, takes all this sand and deposits it on the beaches of southern Namibia. And that's where the, then the, 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 tra the winds have, have deposited them year after year, over millions of years, into uh, Namibia, which is where they get these beautiful red dunes. So, yeah, so um, incredible start to the trip. It's you straight away immersed in this amazing um, desert, which one thinks about when one thinks about Namibia, you think dry, big desert, and that's exactly what it is. Our next, so after we've flown down here from Vintuk to Sosses Flay, we've spent two nights in that area. The dunes aren't the only thing at Sosses Flay. There's also a beautiful canyon carved out by the water called Sesrim Canyon. Um, so lots of things one can do in that area for the couple of nights that we're there. Then from there, we then leave in the morning for a sky safari or a, um, an airborne safari. We get into our plane, into the plains, and we fly directly west towards the uh, Namibian coastline and smack bang into the skeleton coast. Um, as we fly over the dunes, which are magnificent, as you can see here, occasionally even seeing animals like the iconic Chemsbok uh, or Oryx. Flying over these dunes, you'll often come across these old deserted mines that uh, uh, were you know, people would go there to mine diamonds and things and then would just pack up and leave with such harsh, harsh conditions. Um, and then you know you're close to the coast when in the middle of the, uh, the middle of these dunes, a few hundred meters away from the coastline, you'll see these wrecks. And that's where the coastline used to be. Now it's uh, a, a good few hundred meters west of that. You hit along the coastline and flying up the coastline, you'll see other wrecks. Um, the Skeleton Coast is called the Skeleton Coast for a number of reasons, one of them which is that the powerful uh, currents um, and the thick mist along the edge of the Namibian coastline used to wreck a lot of large ships, ships on their way down to uh, the Cape of Good Hope. And along the edge, we'll fly past a couple of these from the air and um, as well on our way up towards Swakopmund, um, we'll also pass over some sea lion, African uh, fur seal colonies. Um, just before we get to Swakopmund, we will then see uh, a beautiful um, estuary or wet, wetland lagoon um, known as Sandwich Harbor. If we're lucky, there'll be some flamingos on there uh, and then we'll start our, our descent. But the flight is really great. You fly really low, giving you good visuals of these amazing and spectacular um, um, views of the landscapes. When we arrive in, um, <coughs> into Stockholmund, we'll be whisked away to the Delight guest house where we'll be staying um, and we'll head out onto, into the Wolfish Bay, um, into the Wolfish Bay Harbour. Now, it's a, when you say a harbour, it's a very large bay actually. And in the bay um, are a number of, number of activities. One of my favorite activities though, is that there's a massive oyster farm. And whilst we're on the catamaran, um, uh, viewing uh, beautiful sea colonies, being visited by the odd pelican that fly past you, uh, we'll be eating delicious oysters that were in the, in the sea just a few, few hours before, which is really great, with some champagne, of course. <laughs> or a bit of lager. All right, um, after our short um, stay at Swakopmund, it's time to get into our game drive vehicles, which we'll keep for the remainder of our time. Um, and what will the, the configuration of those vehicles are, are quite different perhaps to some of the safaris you may have gone on before. They're not totally open. Um, they'll be enclosed with beautiful big windows. Everybody gets a window seat. In fact, there's only 10 guests uh, on, this, on this safari as a maximum for this uh, land program, uh, which means that we'll be split into two vehicles 
five in one vehicle, five in the other, so plenty of space. Um, each person's got a, a lovely window seat. They're very comfortable. There's even a, a fridge inside where they'll keep uh, water and beer and soft drinks and things like that um, that you can have along the way. And our guides will drive us north from Swakopmund um, along the coastline where we'll have chance to see uh, another Cape Fur seal colony up close um, and also a, a quite an iconic shipwreck on the, the edge of the water. Great bird life as well along the sea as we're going out. Um, and then uh, before we hit the small town of Henty Bay and we head east, start heading northeastwards inland towards Damaraland. So just to give you an idea, this is a, a Cape Fur seal colony um, on the Skeleton Coast. And um, amazing, uh, these, these animals come up, they are on land. And for the most part, you know, when they, they swim out to sea, they come back to rest. There's not much that um, uh, attacks them. Obviously in the sea, they've got the, the, the sharks and, and orcas, etc., that will feed on them there. But um, on land, there are one or two um, predators that will, that will take them on. And this particular instance happened to me at quite a, 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 an inopportune moment. So what happened was I had a group of guests. We were at this beautiful sea colony further up north called Mauve Bay. And we had our, the guests were busy watching these uh, seals, these Cape Fur seals, and were taking pictures. It was all fantastic. And I'd had too much coffee on the morning safari on the way there. So I needed to go desperately to go relieve myself in the rocks behind, uh, behind the seal colony. So off I went and I was busy looking around as, as you do. And I turned around and the next thing, I, I felt like I was being watched. And I turned around and true as Bob, there was the brown hyena. Now, the brown hyena for me had uh, always been somewhat of an, an, an enigma on safaris. Um, it's always been one that the guides would say, oh, we saw one yesterday or we saw one the day before or I'd see one at nighttime and it was just two glowing eyes and it would run away. So this was really special. Luckily, I had my camera and I started shooting uh, and uh, the, the brown hyena, as you can see here, was joined then by a black backed jackal. Now, the brown hyena is very special. Um, for most people who've been on safari before, you would have seen the spotted hyena more than likely. Um, and the spotted hyena is one of the apex predators in the, the savannas of Africa. But uh, the brown hyena is a little bit more secretive, um, um, tends to move around on its own for the most part, and, and typically tries to avoid areas where there are lots of spotted hyenas. Um, so we tend to find them in the deserts like the Kalahari Desert in southern Botswana uh, and central Botswana um, and into Namibia, northern South Africa. But that's pretty much where you find them. They're endemic to southern Africa. So um, the, the brown hyena here, I was just amazed. This was the best viewing I've ever had of one. And I tried to get as many pictures as I could before it ran away. Um, but it didn't run away. And that was the most amazing thing. It started, walked around me, did a big loop, and then started coming back down towards the water hole, uh, towards the water hole, towards the, the ocean and the, and the Cape Fur seal colony. Um, and always being followed by his friend there, the, the, the black back jackal. So, um, this had always been for me one of the pictures I, would, I always wanted to get was a brown hyena with the ocean in the background. Um, and what this, the, the, we observed the brown hyena doing is walking up and down looking for the pups of, of the Cape fur seals, which are easy to attack. And he walked up and down together with his friend, the black backed jackal, until eventually he lost interest and moved off. But the the jackals managed to find a, a pup to, to devour. So that was really cool. So once we leave Henty's Bay, um, we also then, um, not long after, leave the dirt, the tar road onto dirt roads, which is great, good adventure. Um, 
and start heading into Damara land. Now in Damara land, there's a little bit more vegetation than there was further south um, and earlier on, on along the trip. Um, the Damara land is called Damara land because of the Damara tribe that live in the area, the Damara people. Very great people will have chance to, to interact and socialize with the Damaras who farm in that area, um, mostly subsistence with goats. Um, and because it is, although there is vegetation, it still is very dry, but very beautiful. There's lots of natural beauty from a geological point of view. Um, there are, we'll drive past a massive uh, plume of rock known as the Brandberg Mountains. The edge of the, the Great Plateau uh, is in its eroded form. Uh, we'll pass by on our way up to Atosha a few days later. Um, and some also we start to see some interesting birds like this, the red-eyed bulbul. And we'll be roughing it over here at Onduli Camp, which is a, a stunning camp um, set perfectly in the, um, in the Damara land area. You can see some of the, um, the landscape from there. And that will be our launch pad for a couple of things. So some of the, one of the reasons that we will go to um, Damara land um, will be to visit a very special place. And it's a place called Twayfelfontein, uh, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, it's been inhabited for over 6,000 years by people um, and there has one of the highest concentrations of rock carvings and engravings. Uh, more than two and a half thousand rock carvings that were made by um, Khoi and uh, other Khoi tribes here. Yeah, you can just see some of them there. It's like a hyena perhaps. And then giraffe, possibly a wildebeest or buffalo. There's even, I think up here, if you follow my cursor there, I think that there is believed to be a penguin. So these guys were traveling between the coast and um, Damara land, so, which is really great. And our guides are, are fantastic who take us around there. Um, we also try to visit it late in the afternoon, which is best for its photograph, uh, photography. It's really cool. That's an ostrich. I don't know if you can see the ostrich. There's the round body two legs, the long neck and face of an ostrich there. So Twayfelfontein is really a great place to go visit. In the area, we've got amazing plants like this, the Welwitchia. Um, once again, our barking gecko, great wildlife. The Macwa uh, chameleon. There's even desert adapted black rhino, which um, uh, roam the, the, the valleys and the hillsides of Damara land as well. Their population is not incredibly dense, so going out to find them, one often has to travel big distances, but generally if we go out looking, we do end up finding because of the stark uh, nature of the uh, terrain. So just in case you've seen black rhino on safari before, um, we, there are a few subspecies of the black rhino. This is the desert adapted black uh, uh, subspecies Dicerus bicornis. Uh, bicornis. Um, if you'd seen them in the Ngorongoro crater or in East Africa, that would have been Dicerus bicornis Michaeli. And it, down here in South Africa, Dicerus bicornis minor. So those are the three subspecies of black rhino. Uh, so it's a very special one to see. As you can see, typical of black rhinos, the calf running behind the mother, unlike the white rhinoceroses that typically will run in front of the mother. Then another great uh, highlight for the Damara land area are the desert adapted black, uh, uh, the desert adapted elephants, which move huge distances in the valleys, up the mountains, down onto these ephemeral rivers, and we'll spend some time uh, in that area looking for the desert adapted elephants too. This on one of my last safaris to Namibia a couple of years ago, well last year, was we came across one of the, the resident herds in the area and we were able to view this 
couple of days old little elephant calf walking with its mother. So special to see. The herds there are much smaller than you may have seen in other parts of Africa. Obviously, there's much less food for them around. That was a really special moment. That's us looking for desert adapted wildlife in Damaraland. And then still at that time of year that we're visiting um, is at the very end of the rain. So we might just see something spectacular like this uh, thunderstorm, which is over Damaraland, could be at that time of year. Just in the foreground here, what's interesting is some of the, the plants that the black rhinos like to devour. This is a species of euphorbia, which they like to feed on. Right, and at the end of any good day of, on safari, one needs a, a sundowner, which there'll be plenty of during the, the, the trip, admiring all these magnificent views in Namibia. Right, so we then move on to our next destination. That's Camp on Dooley at nighttime with this beautiful rock formation at the back. Really special. We leave Camp on Dooley and Damaraland and we head northwards towards Itosha National Park. Now, Itosha National Park um, is incredibly large. It's a, it's a national park that was first proclaimed in 1907 and it is eight and a half thousand square miles in size. So it's a really big national park with lots of varying, ha varying habitats. In the western part, it's quite woody, and then it opens up onto these beautiful um, salt pans, uh, which we'll get to, to visit. What we'll do is, instead of staying inside the national park, there's a, a private game reserve, almost a, a private concession to the southwest of um, Itosha, known as Ongava Game Reserve. And that's where we're gonna be staying, in a really cool camp, this is leaving, um, this picture here is leaving Damara land um, and you can see the, the eroded great plateau that we will um, ascend um, in order to get onto the plateau towards Itosha. So we'll be staying at a, a really great camp, one of my favorite camps in Namibia called um, Ongava Tented Camp. Always lots of water animals close by. We've seen lions, black rhinos, I've even seen a cheetah come through camp there once, um, and they are a herd of lovely kudu bulls um, in front of the tented camp over there. So it's a really great place to explore the area. Um, they have good populations of both black and white rhinos, as well as really good uh, populations of predators, particularly lion. Um, and we'll do a couple of activities on the Ongava Game Reserve, but we will also venture further um, into the Itosha National Park. Now, Itosha National Park, most of it, especially close to the pan, um, is covered in this beautiful chalky white calcretish uh, soil, um, which gets into almost everything. So part of my packing suggestion is always to come is always to come with a, a buff that you can then put over your, your face to so that you don't breathe in the, the dust and then a, a sarong or a kukoi which you can either put over yourself or over your binoculars or camera gear so that you don't get the dust into it. Um, another special is a subspecies of um, impala known as the black-faced impala. They're very beautiful. Uh, massive, massive bull elephants, some of the biggest I've ever seen um, in Itosha National Park. And the great thing about game viewing in that national park is you can drive from waterhole to waterhole. These natural seeping pans um, or water holes attract large amounts of game out from the, the surrounding woodland, such as the blue wildebeest. Great numbers of birds, lots of um, sand grouse, doves, um, 
many other beautiful birds like the crimson breasted shrike um, or the um, lilac breasted rollers, etc. This was also filmed on Ongava Reserve. Um, which is also a really special moment. We were sitting quietly at a, at, a, at a hide in the late afternoon, actually waiting for some rhino to move down to come and drink. But whilst uh, we were waiting, we were, um, we were overjoyed with this amazing spectacle of red-billed quilias, which are, if you can see in the picture, um, filling up this tree here. This tree has no leaves on it. All those are just stacked full of birds. And I'll play you the little clip here so you can get an idea of, um, of what it was like. Really special. Thousands upon thousands upon hundreds of thousands of birds coming down, drinking. At one point, uh, we even saw them half drowning and making their way towards the edge of the water. And every time one of those big flocks came over us in the hive, you could feel the, the wind from their wings beating. It was quite spectacular. So that's the red-billed quilias. Um, and then, just to give you an idea of the starkness of the Itosha pan, now during the rainy season, Itosha pan fills with water, very shallow water, but um, it, it fills with water. In fact, it's used as a, a flamingo um, breeding site. But when it's dry like it is here, animals um, move out across it and have to come in to, to get water every few days and th this was a real stark image of a of an ostrich with its chick walking across the atosha pans which was it was really just sums it up you get these beautiful um the heat mirages forming off the 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 the, the, the pan as the day starts up so it just gives you a bit of an idea of what it looks like out on the atosha pans themselves another nice thing to um do as you can see in the the, the right-hand corner of your screen. It's a good area to view black rhino once again as they come in to drink water. And then these cute and cuddly guys are the Coacafelt um, hyrax. They're a type of bush hyrax or yellow spotted hyrax which hang out on the rocks um, of the Dolomite Hills in uh, Ongava Reserve. And there they are warming up in the morning after cuddling together in little crevices at nighttime. And then as soon as they get warm in the day, they head off to go and feed on uh, uh, some of the succulent plants in the area. Another great thing on Ongava Reserve, there's a number of hides where one can go to photograph animals. So it's great, uh, superb um, numbers of zebra, there, there's water buck in the distance, the giraffe. Um, so there's plenty of different uh, antelope species, dick dick, uh, steenbuck, etc., to keep us busy there. Friendly warthogs and some more of those um, black faced impalas. And for the photography, you get nice low angles at the sunken hide. So they've a number of the water holes they've taken and excavated. Um, these sunken photographic hides which get you almost onto eye level with these animals which is spectacular and then of course at night time um, when the predators come out to drink there as well this also was taken from the, the bird hide that's a short-toed rock thrush and then evening sundowner at, at Itosha. At night time, what's also something fun to do is go around and look at for scorpions. Uh, we use a UV torch or influorescent torch for this. Um, that helps the exoskeleton of the scorpion fluoresces at night time. So you get these beautiful colors. Um, and in fact, that scorpion there, when I took away the, the UV light, that's all that remains. So. Um, see there great so it's always a good idea to wear shoes when you go out 
There's some black rhino coming along to the night hide at Ngava. And that brings us to the end of the, the beautiful time at Itosha. And that's when we start heading down towards our last stop of the trip, which is Okonjima Bush Camp. Now, it'll be on that day that we go and visit the Cheetah Conservation uh, Foundation. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what we're going to do at Okonjima and then hand over to um, Dr. Laurie Marker and her team to tell you a little bit about uh, the Cheetah Conservation Fund. So, on the way into Okonjima, there's some really cool things. It's a uh, Okonjima is a privately owned fenced reserve and there's some really nice camp to end off with at Okonjima Bush Camp. Really nice rooms um, that literally open out onto the bush. Really habituated um, game or animals that get uh, so used to you that they will come. And, uh, I'll show you a picture at the end where a water came up to me when I was busy having my coffee in the morning. Um, and there's some great activities to do from um, whilst we're here. One of them for the birders is to look for this little creature known as a rock runner. Um, there's also um, some of the cheetah and the leopard on the reserve have got telemetry collars on them for research uh, and tourism purposes. So it means that we can go out and look for them. Um, uh, at after dark, there's also a chance that we can get out with the team who are um, studying pangolin and go look for uh, the pangolin, um, which is a strictly nocturnal creature coming out at night time and go spend time with them after dark. That usually happens um, when one is spotted. Um, we get a call back at camp and if it coincides with us uh, having had dinner, um, then, then we you know, wake up often sometimes I've even been woken up at about midnight and said come on they found one let's go and off we go to go and see this rare and elusive creature the scaly um, ground pangolin which is a really cool thing and then after dinner another um, little activity that they do um, for years out the back of the kitchen um, animals like honey badgers and porcupines have been stealing the scraps. So have, after giving up, they just every night at a certain time put out all the, the, the scraps from the kitchen and you get these porcupines and honey badgers coming around to take a little nibble before heading off onto, um, uh, before they head off into the night to go look for other food. There's that warthog I was telling you about. So folks, um, just before I, cross over to, to Laurie now and, and, and her team, Laurie and Brian, etc. cetera. Um, it is a magnificent trip. Um, I've done trips uh, similar to this um, in the past, but this particular one, the way that we do it in a clockwise motion, um, just allows us to really immerse ourselves into the desert, um, get slowly but surely more and more vegetation, the game gets a bit bigger, um, the experience just goes on, it's, it's superb. And then we end off with a trip to these incredible and vital conservation um, efforts like uh, the, the Cheetah Conservation Fund, et cetera. And we can really um, get to you know, appreciate um, all the wild animals we've seen beforehand um, because of the hard work that's been done by, by teams like, like Laurie and hers. So folks, uh, um, to those of you who've already signed up, we're going to have a great time. And anybody else who wants to sign up on this trip, that would be awesome too. Um, just so you know, um, we'll, we'll be doing a day visit to the Cheetah Conservation Fund. But um, the marketing team at Zagram are busy at the moment um, uh, with, with, with the Cheetah Conservation um, Foundation. And we'll be doing a post um, uh, extension to the trip uh, for anybody who wants to go and spend more time with what Laurie and her team are going to tell us about shortly. The great part about this safari too is that if you've ever wanted to do Namibia and Botswana, um, this is a great chance to do both. We're going to be doing 
10-day safari in Namibia and a 10-day safari in um, uh, Botswana straight after this one. So if you, if you wanted to, you could go do Namibia, then take three days at C, uh, CCF, the Cheetah Conservation Fund, and then go straight on to Botswana and spend a month in um, two of the most beautiful parts of Africa. So I hope to see you all then. It's been lovely chatting to you, and, um, and I'll hang around till, till the end to answer any questions. I'm going to stop sharing now so that Laurie and her team can do, do that. But thank you for taking the time to listen. So, Laurie, um, okay. are you there? How are you doing, man? I'm great. That was fun. Oh, I love going on tour with you. <laughs> All those places, and it's just it's so much fun. I know everyone will have a great job. Um, Tom, seeing everything. So, um, we'll do a little overview of the Cheetah Conservation Fund. I know a couple of the people there um, have said they've been here, which is wonderful. And if you haven't, do come to Namibia. Um, and do come to visit us here at Cheetah Conservation Fund. Um, Brian Badger is my partner in crime over in the United States, and I'm over here in Namibia. And he is going to be running, I think, some um, uh, slides. We're going to start with a short little video. We are 30 years old. So although I've been studying cheetahs for oh, over 45 years, I started my research here in Namibia in the early 70s, and then actually um, moved here permanently and set up a foundation at Namibia's independence 30 years ago. So this is just a short little video giving you an overview of where we've come from in a 30 year period of time. And then I'll talk a little bit more about our programs. I hope you enjoy this, it'll be fun. Conservation Fund in 1990. Over a 30 year period of time, we've gotten people to be aware that the cheetah has needs and has problems and that we have solutions and we can actually do something to save the cheetah. The cheetah is the fastest land animal, but we have to be even faster if indeed we're going to try to save it for the future. 
and I think the future is all about the people who work here, our staff, the people that I've worked with for um, a very, very long time. Setting up the Cheetah Conservation Fund has been my life, a life that I've been able to give to this most amazing species there is on Earth. And those of you, our friends, who have actually helped support the work that we've done to put programs together to make the cheetah a part of an ecosystem, a part of a country, a part of a continent, and a part of the world. So a huge heartfelt thanks to everybody who's allowed us to grow, who have seen our vision, supported our mission, and are helping us save the cheetah. Thank you. Well, good. Well, that gives you an overview of what um, we've done in a 30-year period. And I just thought I'd cover some of our programs rather quickly. Um, so what the problem here is in Namibia is farmers catch and kill cheetahs. And with that, we've ended up with a sanctuary. So we do have about 40 cheetahs sitting here at our center. Uh, we've been able to put the majority of them back out into the wild. Most of our cats live in very large, large camps and are exercised regularly. Today, we actually did a workup on a little cub that just came in um, from the east and was able to collect blood on it, identify it. It's a male. It's about five months old, and it's in good, well, good condition, so to speak, after being in a farmer's trap cage for um, over about a month's period of time. So what we are trying to do is to stop this catching and killing. We have a number of animals that can go back out in the wild, like over 600 but some of them have to stay in captivity because they come in at too young of an age. And so our big camps, like these that you're looking at here, our cats are all exercised regularly. And our cats are also a part of our long-term research to understand how to keep cheetahs healthy. And again, I've studied cheetahs for over 45 years, coming from the Smithsonian, and then looking at how they're living out here in the wild. And a lot of our research is done also with like camera traps, which we put up throughout our land. We've also put camera traps throughout many of the area, cheetah areas throughout the country. Within these camera traps, we get to find out more about the other animals that are living, but also what are living with the cheetahs. So we find a variety of different great species. These are all nocturnal animals that we study and we watch because we're studying an entire ecosystem. I always call this kind of the cheetah's garden. Of course, we get great pictures of um, cheetahs, and you can identify all the different cheetahs by their different spot patterns. So we have a very big database of the numbers of cheetahs throughout, actually, the, the homeland or the rangelands of the cheetahs. Their ranges are about 1,500 square kilometers. That's about 800 square miles. So it's very, very, very huge. Overlapping, though, with the cheetahs, we also find leopards. Um, and we get pictures like these mothers with cubs, and it's just very heartwarming. Another way we study the cheetah, too, is using scat detection dogs. And what we do is we find scat, which is we call black gold. It's poop. Um, and yet, you know, again, when you're covering an area of about 800 square miles, you don't find a lot of poop with your eyes. And so we use these dogs that are trained to sniff um, and find the poop. And then we can collect the poop and we take it to our genetics lab, where from there, um, we're able to actually extract the DNA. And you'll see our genetics lab when you come here and visit. But we also, under a microscope, can actually look at the hairs of the, under the, the microscope of what the cheetahs are eating. And that helps us share that information back with the farming community to understand more about how the cheetahs living on their land with them. But from the DNA, um, we actually are actually able to come up with identifying individual animals. Uh, we're able to understand more about the population structure. This is our genetics lab. We've got gene sequencers. We get a number of Namibian students and students from throughout Southern Africa. We're the only genetics lab um, really outside of a couple of the major cities in South Africa. And we've helped set up a couple labs also like in Kenya, where we also have collaborations as well. 
So we have a number of students that come in and you'll get to view our lab and learn more about um, some of our um, collaborations that are going on there. And then every cheetah that comes into us, and we've worked on over a thousand cheetahs, like today where we worked on this little cub that just arrived. Um, this is what our team looks like. We do have, uh, we'll, we'll tube the animal and put it on gas anesthetic. We'll take blood, tissues, measurements of the animals. Um, if it's a male, we'll collect sperm and we bank that sperm. Where actually just um, a few months ago, the first cubs were born through um, artificial, well, actually um, in vitro fertilization, which is a part of the long-term research that we've been involved in. And that was at the Columbus Zoo with our collaborators from the um, Smithsonian. So this is what our, our research team looks like and what some of the work looks like when we are actively working on um, a cheetah. And over a thousand cheetahs that we worked on, over 600 of them have been able to go back out into the wild. Now, we put these collars on um, a number of animals, and that's a satellite collar. And the satellite collars will last for a couple of years, and we usually try to recollar them. They do have what's called a break off, and so we can program it so it will drop off at a certain period of time, unless we can actually um, dart the animal again and actually recollar it. And then we're able to get points on where that animal's moving about every hour. And as we start learning more about where it's living, we expand that to about two to four times a day. So studying the cheetah has been a very big part of the work that we've done. We've published lots of papers on it. It's been baseline information. And then the cats are able to go back out into the wild. And this is probably one of the most thrilling parts of my life is seeing an animal being free and tracking where it's living. And after um, tracking about you know, 600 of the animals, we understand a lot more about where they are living. And working together so closely with the farming community, um, they start learning more about where their animals are. And part of that is helping them learn that the cheetahs and other predators are not gonna be just killing their livestock. It's, we're a livestock farming community. You will see a lot of cattle. And about 80% of our wildlife is found on our livestock farmlands, which are huge. So you'll see a lot of fences. Some of them are high, most of them are low. We breed and place these um, large dogs. It's an Anatolian Shepherd or a Kangal dog, a Turkish breed of dog that's been used for about 6,000 years. We brought them in 25 years ago. So this is a 25 year program. We bred and placed with farmers over um, nearly 700 dogs at this point in time. So we breed them here and we work with the farming communities and then we put them out with the livestock where they grow up with the livestock. And those little kids, they're not really just playing with the puppies, they're learning about how the dog works with the stock. But you know, the kids were the ones that were usually herding the livestock. Now the dogs are protecting the livestock and the children are able to go to schools. Unfortunately, all of our schools are closed right now because of COVID, but with that, we've got a lot of kids on a network called the Namibian Environmental Education Network, and we're actually helping educate the children throughout the country as well. But the dogs, we see about an 80% decrease of livestock loss by having the dogs with the farmers. And that means the farmers are not killing so many cheetahs or other predators. Now this is our One Health program. We go into the communities, and this is our veterinarian, a woman right here, um, with a, uh, our team, and we're vaccinating the um, rural communities' dogs against rabies, which is a um, debilitating, killing disease. And our government doesn't have the funds actually to vaccinate the dogs. We've gone out into the communities and are actually vaccinating the rural community dogs to protect them, and it's a part of a teamwork that we do, as well as looking at their livestock. Our training programs, and we've worked with over now 20,000 farmers, teaching them about what predators out there, how the predators live, and actually working with them so that they are actually being um, partners in conservation. And again, um, since the cheetahs are living on farmlands with livestock, the protection of the livestock is really, really critical. And that's why we spend so much time 
in our, we call it our Future Farmer of Africa program. But we also run a model farm. So when you are um, visiting us, you will actually learn about our livestock, our livestock guarding dogs, all of our cheetahs, but we also have a dairy. Um, so since we have to raise the dogs up, we have gone from having just our boar goats that you eat to a long-term program, which is milk goats. So we milk the goats and we actually make cheeses, uh, fudge, ice cream, and we actually share these and, um, throughout the country. And so our products are actually found in different stores, but it's a model program and we bring people in from the communities to learn more about livestock care and added value to the products that they could have by having their livestock. So this has become, it's called the dancing goat creamery because our goats dance, they're protected by dogs and they're saving cheetahs. Now our education programs, we not only teach kids here at our center, but we actually travel throughout the country. We deal usually with about 25,000 school kids a year. This year, uh, we were at about 7,000 kids when COVID hit. And now again, we're trying to do anything that we can online, but we're also trying to go to the communities to share educational materials with the kids that cannot go to schools at this point in time. But the curriculums that we've developed um, are very important. We've got um, kids' books that go on. We also get a lot of interns from internationally, from schools like um, Stanford. We get schools like um, Cornell, uh, a variety of the different schools, a lot of the Oregon schools, um, UC Davis. These are some of the education materials that we've developed, our teacher's guide, a predator's role in the ecosystem. So we do so much in our education programs with our, our children. And then on the other side, we also publish books. And so we've done a variety of different books from um, um, two major books, which is, I would recommend if you want to know about cheetahs to get this, um, which we published just about two years ago. And it's everything you'd ever want to know about cheetahs their biology and conservation. And of course, Future of Cheetahs is a beautiful picture book with great stories, but the Cheetahs Biology and Conservation is a textbook and tells you all about the uh, biology and anything you'd wanna know. And all of these books are available on our website, which is cheetah.org. So we do welcome you to learn more about um, cheetahs, as well as, um, as you're coming here to Namibia, you're gonna learn a lot about the ecosystem as well as how the cheetahs live in these ecosystems, not only here in Namibia, but throughout Botswana, South Africa, into their entire range up in Kenya. And it'll be very interesting to all of you who are world travelers and love Africa. So we welcome you to learn more about that. We do have a lovely little eco lodge and we, would love you to come and spend uh, those couple days between your Namibia and Botswana trip. <clears throat> Our lodge has just five rooms, so it's very small and very, very um, exclusive. And when people are here visiting us, they get to partake in the different activities and learn more about what we do here from our staff, our scientists, and see the beautiful view, we have a view of what's called the Waterberg Plateau, which is a national park, and our land abuts that. And we have, I think, one of the most beautiful places in the world. This is our backyard, and we welcome you to come and have a sundowner with us as well. Um, and we monitor all of our wildlife as well. Our lands are about 150,000 acres that we manage and care for. And we have huge herds of migratory oryx, Artabies, eland, as well as those of um, uh, the different predators like cheetahs and leopards and brown hyenas. We get night drives and we just welcome you to come and visit. These are some of the um, our rooms that we have. We've got a lovely um, little restaurant and the view of all of our rooms is looking at again at the Wa Waterberg Plateau. So that gives you a little bit of an overview of us of the Cheetah Conservation Fund. And as you can hear, I am from America, uh, but I've been here in Namibia for 30 years and have been a part of developing a nation. And I'm very proud of the work that we've done in um, integrating cheetahs 
into a nation. We call Namibia the cheetah capital of the world, and it's because of the work that we've done working so closely with the farming communities. And even with that, we do still have orphan cats that we have to take care of, and we exercise them every day, so you get to watch them run. It's a great place for photography and learning a little bit more close up about these amazing species that are critically endangered. Today, there are less than 7,100 cheetahs left in the world. And um, that's why we work so hard from our Namibian base, but we work throughout the entire cheetah range. We do have our offices also in the United States, but we are a registered charity um, in about eight different countries around the world with our main headquarters here in Namibia. So again, we welcome you and we can't wait to meet you. And Chris, I know that your trip is gonna be great. And we are just so ecstatic to be partnered with um, uh, you all uh, with our 30 year relationship of helping save wildlife in Africa. So all of you can come visit and enjoy. So thank you so much for listening to our together um, Zoom um, African Safari and a little bit about conservation and science and how you can join us and be a part of us. So thank you um, and do learn about us more. Please go to our website and we've got really fun stuff on our social media. We try to keep everybody informed on our day-to-day -day work that goes on here. The farmers meetings, the different cheetahs we're working on, where they're living um, and who's visiting us. So thanks a lot. It's just great to be a part of your family and uh, to have you come and visit us here in Namibia. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laurie. That was amazing. Really interesting. And I can't wait to get there myself next year and with, with luck meet you and, and your, your furry family in person. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Thank you so and much. Thank you guys both so much for this today. Um, and yes, it is amazing that we are having this partnership, that we're both celebrating 30 years. So that's an amazing collaboration. We're so excited to be, to be visiting on our upcoming trip, which is not too long from now. It's in April. Um, so thank, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Dr. Lori. 